Hello and welcome to episode three of Expected Value, a podcast that goes inside the sports analytics world. I'm Paul Carr from True Media Networks. And our guest this week is Michael Lopez, the NFL's Director of Football Data and Analytics. Mike has been in this position for a little over a year. He's the first person to hold the job with the NFL. As he'll explain, he brings both a strong academic background and a coaching perspective to the job. He played college football and grew up in a coaching family, and he's a statistics professor at Skidmore College in upstate New York. Mike has a math degree from Bates College in Maine, a master's in stats from UMass, and a PhD in biostatistics from Brown. Follow Mike on Twitter at StatsByLopez. In my conversation with Mike, he'll talk about what exactly he does for the NFL, state of analytics in the league, working with the NFL's competition committee, the league's first big data bowl held earlier this year, his advice for students and anyone who wants a career in sports analytics, and why a former Nebraska quarterback is his favorite athlete. Then Albert Larcata and I will be back to react to the interview and wrap things up. Now, without further ado, here's the expected value conversation with the NFL's Michael Lopez. We're joined here on Expected Value by Michael Lopez, the National Football League's Director of Football Data and Analytics. Michael, thank you for joining us. Let's start at a high level. Broadly speaking, what does the NFL's Director of Football Data and Analytics do? So, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Paul. I'm excited excited to be here and talk a little bit about football. Uh, So on our end, we're we're primarily focused on football data itself. Uh, What does the data tell us about the game? What does the data tell us about our players? What does the data tell us about where the game is going to be in 10, 15, 20 years? And so that consists of looking at a lot of our game data, health and safety data, pace of play, um, but also looking at our players, uh, where they have been, some of our youth and high school data, and then also our legends group too. So we're working with a lot of different partners within the league, but again, it's primarily focused on the game and its players. So what's a typical day look like for you, you know, this week during the off season, we'll say? Sure. So a lot of it's prepping stuff for the upcoming season. So within a season, we'll be responsible for delivering weekly reports to executives. Uh, We're also doing some long-term planning in terms of events that we might be responsible for. Last year, for example, our group was responsible for the Big Data Bowl, uh, which we dropped some player tracking data and and were able to crowdsource some ideas. And so right now, kind of the long-term plans are, what are we going to have ready in the regular season once it begins? Uh, And then also planning for events that will be upcoming, one of which will hopefully be the second Big Data Bowl. So anything special for you on an NFL Sunday? You've been there you know, about a year, so you've been through one season. Does an NFL Sunday look any different for you from a work perspective? Only in the sense that I, I'm a little bit more keen on team behavior and, uh, and sort of what's going on in the game, whereas before maybe I was focused on the scores or focusing on a fantasy football player. Now I'm, I'm primarily keyed on our play there, are, are the players healthy, are the games close, uh, and, and maybe not exactly the way a typical fan watches the games. Um, but we're certainly tuned in, and a lot of what we do with football data is to try and better understand the game. And the best way to do that is to get our ideas from watching the game. Uh, and, and so that consists, you know, I'm not much different than anybody else on a, on a Thursday or a Sunday or a Monday. Um, but we are sort of looking at it a little bit differently, only in the sense that we want to make sure the, the games are competitive and, 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 of course, that the players are healthy. We're talking with Michael Lopez, the NFL's Director of Football Data and Analytics here on the Expected Value Podcast. You talked about you know, using the data to make the league better, generally speaking. Some of your work has been public. Uh, you p- published a piece on using win probability to show how much pass interference penalties affect the team's chance to win, and that presumably had some effect on the co- competition committee's decision to make pass interference reviewable. So what's kind of the reaction you get from uh, coaches, people on the competition committee, when you're presenting data like that? How do they handle it? So, I mean, I, I only have one year of experience, um, but it, w- it was fairly positive. I mean, I think we're able to come at football from a, a lens in that maybe they're not used to seeing. And it's, it's a different it's a different vibe. You know, when you're with a team, I think the primary focus of that team is winning. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal of everybody in the competition committee room is to make the game better. And so we're all sort of united under that one goal. And so because of that, you know, I, I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but it was certainly a sense of, 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 last year there was a 
a specific focus on on replay. Um, and if you look back at a lot of the proposals that came in in terms of what the competition committee might do to change the game, a lot of the proposals centered around 15 yard penalties. And so our job was to sort of assess are those are those realistic proposals? What would they do to the game? How often do 15 yard penalties happen? Well, when they do happen, uh, generally which teams are helped or hurt? From our perspective, we started to do that, and then we realized that, well, let's look at all other types of penalties. Uh, we included pass interference calls at that point. And when you sort of uh, take the perspective of what, what impacts games, uh, the, the metric that I would use in terms of swinging one, one, game, one team's chances from, from good to bad or from bad to good or from good to really good, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we, st- we stumbled across win probability. And so, uh, you know, Lots of folks have derived win probability models. I've had a version that I've been able to use for a couple of years. We matched it to our calls and it, it sort of made an intuitive sense for the coaches to be able to say like, all right, yeah, you know, I was a part of this game. I remember this being a good play that helped us mm-hmm. um, or I was a part of this game and I remember this being a, a play that hurt us. And for us to be able to show them plays and say, all right, you want to know what win probability is. Here's an example where your win probability went up 4%. Here's an example where your win probability went up 12%. And then here's this pass interference penalty where your win probability dropped 17%. And to be able to put like small percentages on them to sort of correspond to what they actually get when they watch the film, that's what they're used to dealing with. And they're used to be able to say like, oh, I remember that play. I know what happened on that play. And so from our perspective, you know, what they ultimately decided to do with replay is a little bit outside of our domain. But we were certainly able to put some data uh, perspective to the sense of, what calls impact games? When do they impact the games? And if we are going to uh, review something, what, what should we be able to review? Uh, in, in this case, if you look at the the, the, the calls that swing games the most, uh, generally those tend, tend to be pass interference penalties. And so, um, you know, I, I'm ultimately, we, we, I don't know the world uh, that that it could have existed if, if we didn't have that information. Um, all we got to observe is what happened last year. Um, but I, I do like to think that we played a little bit of a role in sort of centraling the focus on pass interference penalties. Um, but ultimately, they could have included more penalties. They could have included fewer. And that a lot of that, those decisions are sort of up to the, the powers that be. Mm-hmm. Looking at just kind of the general state of, we'll say, NFL and football analytics, I think, you know, the consensus is it's behind, like everyone else, it's behind baseball, a little behind basketball. I think the gap seems to be closing. What sort of advances has the NFL made, generally speaking, over the last five years or so analytics-wise? I mean, I think the personally, it, I, I will note that just as, as somebody who's been in football, I mean, coaches have been using numbers for decades. Um, I, I think I, I would probably agree that mm-hmm. there were a little bit slower to pick up on some of the, the trends that maybe maybe some researchers had found, you know, five, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but I think coaches have always used numbers. They've always tried to use tendencies about how players are leaning or about how linebackers are moving their feet or things like that. Um, they've just been a little bit more in-house. Um, and, and so I think with the advent of player tracking data, I think we're, we're hopefully going to see um, even more sort of uh, ways of looking at, 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 at new, I guess, ways of taking what coaches have always been able to do and putting, putting numbers to it. Uh, in terms of public work, one of the things that's, that's, that's really hurt football data for a long time is that within a given play, you have hundreds of movements, hundreds of player decisions that they're making in their heads. At the end of the day, all we see is one row in a data set. And so at the end of a game, you get 160 rows. The problem is, is like I said, those 160 rows realistically reflect uh, millions of subtle movements that ideally we would like to be able to measure. Player tracking data can give us that. And so I think the future is, is bright. Um, but from a, a perspective of like, what are those 160 rows giving us at this point? Well, realistically, teams are passing more. Uh, they're passing better. And I'm not sure if they're passing more because they're passing better or if they're passing more because they've realized that uh, in general, um, researchers have suggested that passing more is better. Uh, the other strategy that we noticed last year is in terms of fourth down aggressiveness. Teams last year went forward on fourth and one more than they ever had before and went forward on fourth and two more than they ever had before. And so from a, a league perspective, we're interested in following those trends. We want to make sure that those things are good for the game. Um, not that we would really be able to do much about it, but only in the sense that we want to understand how teams are behaving. And I think those are, are probably two of the bigger trends that have happened over the last half dozen years. So you talked about the tracking data, the NGS data. Give us kind of the nutshell version on kind of what it is and the direction that it's going on the whole for the league. So our our media group out in, in Los Angeles is is sort of the, the main drivers of the next gen stats. And so each 
uh, I, sh I should be giving them the credit. I, I don't exactly, um, I get to work with the data, um, but the data really stems from them and they get most of the credit for how it works, but it's, it's highly accurate. And what it comes from is each player has chips embedded in each of his two shoulder pads. And so those chips uh, emit an RFID signal and that signal is tracked wherever the player goes on the field. And the nice part is, is that we get 10, 10 observations per second, roughly. And those are, are observed basically in real time. And we can aggregate that data and share it with teams so that they understand where were players on the field, how fast were they moving, what was their direction, their orientation, their acceleration. And so you can use that information to, to get a better sense of what players were doing when maybe they don't necessarily appear in our play-by-play -play data. Uh, and so, you know, you, I, I mentioned 160 rows before. Now we have on a, on a given game, if you, if you want to look at, if you want to give each player at each moment in time when he was on the field a, a sort of row in a data set, now you're talking about 400,000 rows of data. And I wouldn't exactly call it big data, but relative to where we were, it is really big data. And so uh, it, it's kind of an exciting forefront where there are a lot of questions that teams want to ask. Um, some teams are, are asking them, some teams are, are, are maybe not asking them as much, but the, the, the question is, it, it takes time to answer those questions and it takes a football specific expertise and, and sort of that combination of, of merging football expertise with, uh, with sort of analytical, analytical acumen is, is kind of where the league is going. And so it's, it's kind of an exciting time to be in the league. It's kind of an exciting time to be in football. And I do think that um, the, the sort of overall interest in data will, will hopefully continue to grow uh, in front offices. Um, if anything, because we have this huge trove of data and we aren't exactly sure what questions we should ask ask from that data. Without um, we'll get into like specifics of what a certain team is doing, what's kind of the general state of, I'll just call it like an analytics staff for teams? You kind of touched on how some are using it, some are not in different ways. What, what's your kind of average NFL team look like from uh, kind of a, a staffing and people using the NGS analytics sort of thing? So the, some of the details, I think we have to, I, I mean, at least I personally have to be a little bit careful of sharing, of course, just because sure. there are teams out there that, that want to maintain a competitive edge. And there are teams out there that, um, that have publicly hired. There are teams out there that are privately hired. From, from the player tracking perspective, uh, one of the, the really tricky things is that a, a lot of times you'll ask a question and you can't answer it right away. Um, or you try to answer it and it takes you a couple of weeks. And, and then you actually don't get an answer because you realize either you couldn't really answer it or because uh, maybe it just wasn't an interesting finding. And that, that can be frustrating. Um, and, and I compare that to like a, a scout or somebody who's watching film. If I want to watch, um, if I want to, uh, if I want to like compare strategies and maybe my goal is like, let's, let's look at the gunner on a punt team to figure out um, what, it, what does that gunner typically do when he's running down the field? Like what is his strategy for, for um, uh, evading blocks? If I wanted to have a, a scout watch that film and figure that answer out, that scout would probably have it in an hour. If I wanted to have an analyst do it, well, that analyst would probably have to spend several weeks writing an algorithm to figure out all the possible routes for a gunner, be able to work with the data so that it's always going in the same direction to be able to account for a lot of other variables on the field, or has the mm -hmm. scout had that answer several weeks back? And, and so it can be really tricky to sort of find the best balance of what, what is how are we going to measure player behavior? How are we going to measure player patterns? Ultimately, of course, if you are able to build out a model to figure out, okay, what are these patterns of these certain players? Well, that's going to save you a ton of time. And eventually those, those hours will add up. Um, but but they're, they're not easy answers. And I think for sure, one of the, the, the challenges is that a lot of times coaches want quick answers. You don't have months to prepare for a gunner on a punt team. You have realistically <laughs> 10, 15 right. minutes. And so because of that, it, it can be, it, the integration of this is is not it, is, it's just not going to be exactly seamless, uh, and so you have to sort of figure out. And this is what what teams I'm I'm sure are doing, and some teams are are probably doing it um, in ways that I can't even fathom. But what are the what are the ways to look at this data to answer questions that coaches need to know? Uh, and, and and specifically, not only what are the the ways we can use this data, but like what what can we actually get the most out of in terms of our time? Um, because you know, by and large, we, we don't have uh, staffs that are like the Astros or like the Dodgers, where you have a, an army of analysts and right. uh, and most NFL staffs are, are going to be smaller than that. And so because of that, you have to you now have a time crunch because you don't want your analysts working 
um, 16 hours a day because they're going to get burnt out too. So you kind of have to find the talent, the, the time to figure out like, all right, what do we need to know? And then what is that next step that tracking can get us? And more specifically, what is the, the best way we can use that tracking data given the a lot of time that we have? Talking with Michael Lopez, the NFL's Director of Football Data and Analytics on the Expected Value Podcast. You've touched on the big data bowl that you guys ran earlier this year, the first one. So you gave a sample of NGS data to college students and professionals, let them look at things like player speed, rule changes, route combinations. This is one of the first big public releases of NGS data. And, and from what I've read, you had plenty of good entries and a lot of good, good ideas. What did you take away from the whole big data bowl experience? So it was interesting when I interviewed, uh, one of the questions they asked me about the position was like, what would you do, um, to, to sort of drive innovation around data? And I, you know, I, I have publicly been outspoken against other leagues and, and how they've sort of used hackathons to generate cheap labor. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of ha was put on the spot a little bit at the time. And I kind of said like, all right, well, let's be honest. I, I think it would be good to get some of our data out there. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know most folks that are have been looking at football data are looking at 160 rows per game. We now have this data that we can use, uh, and um, I, I kind of I knew I was up against a little bit of resistance in terms of th this isn't typically shared by professional leagues um, in terms of shared publicly. Um, but the NBA was super helpful. We met with them about how they ran their event, and we kind of took what we wanted to do, which was make it maybe a little bit more open, but also take some of the core ideas that they've had and that they've had, they found success with over the years. Um, so we, we released uh, the first six weeks from the 2017 season. We released that in uh, mid December and we gave participants about five to six weeks to work with it. Folks submitted uh, papers that were built off of that data. And then we had judges from team staffers. Uh, so each team, um, I wouldn't say each team, Probably about 20 to 25 teams, uh, at least one volunteer from them uh, worked to judge these papers. And we tallied their their scores and the top eight, uh, top eight folks or the top eight submissions were invited to, to combine to participate. And so we, we didn't have an enormous prize, but you did get this sort of um, exciting aspect of, of going to combine. Um, we paid for folks' travel and we, we uh, yeah, they got to meet NFL staffers. They got to meet, uh, uh, I think, uh, I want to say Nate Burleson was there, Cynthia Freeland was there from the NFL Network. So it was kind of a nice event to to be able to share your ideas. And, um, you know, we were, I'm happy to, to sort of brag a little bit. Uh, 11 of the participants in the Big Data Bowl from last year have been hired by the NFL teams or their affiliates. Nice. And so um, it, it's it's been a nice, uh, you know, one of our main drivers of that event was to create some type of pipeline um, so that if you want to work in the NFL, um, you know, in, in our view, player tracking data is the one area that that, that teams are, are curious about. And so it kind of made sense to crowdsource a little bit, get some ideas, and then also create that pathway so that teams that, that are able to, to open up spots for more analytics staffers are able to have um, sort of clearly defined uh, or, or at least uh, additional people that they might be able to reach out to. So you said you have a, another or a similar sort of event coming up. What can you tell us about that? Any changes you're going to make as you go about it again? Yeah. So, I mean, I think last year we we gave five weeks for people to work with player tracking data. And that's interesting because I also told you um, 10 minutes ago that player tracking data can take a lot of time. And so right. uh, pretty much the universal response was we would have liked to have had more time with this data. And okay. I totally sympathize. And I think that was one of our major lessons. So we're hoping to double that this year and have maybe two and a half months or so. Um, the details are a little bit, uh, I don't know if I can formally share them yet, but we're hoping to have a, a little bit of a bigger stake in terms of prize money. Uh, last year's focus was a little bit more, was on pass plays generally. That, that's where most folks submitted. Um, this year, we're going to probably go with a more uh, different focus, maybe on run plays. Uh, and the, the, the expectation is that we'll be, we'll be releasing that either mid to late September. We're also hoping that it times up a little bit with the academic semester and that you'll be able to, um, if you can, can sort of start, uh, you know, a project built out of tracking data, you'd be able to work with this and then, and then submit to our contest, um, in late December, which is roughly when, when most semesters end. So, you know, we, we have higher plans to, to sort of continue college engagement and, and to try and, and, and get folks into football data and to recognize that, you know, that, that this is a viable career for, for data people that, that also like football. 
Michael Lopez, NFL's Director of Football Data and Analytics, is our guest on Expected Value. Let's shift gears a little into kind of your career path here, which is, you know, just looking at the resume, is largely academic, math degree, worked in public schools, master's in stats, PhD in biostats. How did you first, just as a you know fan or for recreation or whatever, how did you first kind of get into working on sports? So my dad was a football coach. And so, uh, you know, Saturday mornings, he was a high school football coach and he was the the head coach of a a town called Lincoln Sudbury um, outside of Boston. And so, you know, when, when it was Friday night, he was coaching the games and I was the water boy. And then on Saturday mornings, you know, before you had, you know, DVDs or huddle or anything like that, you Mm -hmm. know, he was exchanging film and, and, and VHS and we were recording and I would wait for him to, you know, I was watching every game with him. Um, And so I've always sort of been into the strategy aspect of it. You know, I think I went on kind of an academic career because I also really like statistics and, you know, quite honestly, the, the job I have now didn't exist. Um, I mean, to be fair, it didn't exist a year ago uh, or two years ago, much less, you know, 15 or 20 years ago when I was sort of looking at careers. Um, And so I I went into high school coaching with him and I was a high school teacher at the town next door. Um, And a lot of that was because I really liked those doing those two things. And if I could teach AP stats and coach high school football, um, I would be really happy. Um, I I think that's I I would love doing it. And I, I was pretty damn close to to just doing that for the the rest of my career. Um, I got a little bit of the itch to go back to grad school. And once I did that, I, I kind of recognized that there was a lot of stats that I didn't know. And, and because of that, um, you know, I, I did two years at, at UMass and, you know, I started learning some, some models that I, I, I like to use and I wanted to use in sports and I wanted to use in public health. And that's what brought me to Brown. Uh, and then, you know, I think that the traditional track when you're in, in grad school is, is you mostly focus on academia and, I like the idea of teaching and I like the idea of a smaller, large college. And again, I would have been really happy doing that. Uh, it just sort sure, sure of turned out that, you know, that, that itch that I got when I was, you know, coaching and, and helping my dad back 30 years ago, you know, is the same one that's always in the back of my head. You know, ultimately when I'm watching a football game, I'm thinking like, did they write to make the right call? Uh, did they, you know, did they call the right play? You know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, of, of coach speak. And, and so when, you know, when this, opportunity opened up where a lot of what I was doing, which was football analysis, you know, could be sort of the full-time role. It was, it was too hard to turn down. Sure. Yeah. And so I know you, you know, you've made the rounds of stat conferences, did a lot of writing and such. When did you first kind of realize you might be getting the attention of uh, decision makers, whether it's the teams or the league or something like that? Um, it, 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 to be honest, it's never really been a goal of mine, um, mm-hmm. only in the sense that you know, when you're, when you're in academia, your goal is to appease your advisor. Uh, <laughs> and your goal is, <laughs> while it's, you know, you're not trying to make the coach of a hockey team or a football team interested in you. Um, it just, your, your job is to get papers published and to review articles and, and sort of push the field further. And I think that's, that's kind of, you know, I was never really thinking, oh, I want to get hired by a team um, in large part because, you know, for the last you know, I've had a, I have an eight year old at this point and I, I now have two kids. And, and so for, certainly for the last eight years, you know, it's not like we're going to go flopping around, move into a, a random town just because I want to analyze football or hockey data, yep. um, mostly because the, those are the realistically the only two sports that I'd, I'd be, you know, I've, I've been doing an uh, analysis in. And so, you know, we're, we're quite happy where we've been. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate enough now that we could kind of mostly stay where we are in terms of the new gig. Um, so the, the goal was never really to to try and get noticed, um, unless it was get noticed by academic journals, in which case, yeah, that that was the goal. Um, but <laughs> um, you know, if 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 we're able to to sort of have a small impact, and this goes with with any of the papers I've written, whether it's academic or or blog posts or, or other things, if if it does get get noticed and teams or, or leagues are are interested, then 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 great. Um, but I'm I'm mostly doing it for a, a lot of it's for my own curiosity, or at least it was you know, before I started this job, sure. a lot of it was just to sort of answer questions that, that I thought were interesting. So, you know, the announcer says something and you want to be able to check, was the announcer yeah. accurate or was the announcer inaccurate? And it's not necessarily to pick on an announcer. It's more because that announcer is giving you a really good question that you hadn't thought of before. Um, and, and that's kind of where a lot of the initial work that I was able to do, you know, stem from. So how did the NFL role come about then? How, you, know, you started just over a year ago. What was, what can you tell us about the process of getting on with the league itself? 
So I, I think there was a recognition. Um, the the person that hired me is Damani Leach, and he's a, an outstanding leader and um, a, a good friend. And, um, you know, he worked with Troy. He, he, at the time, he was working with Troy Vincent, who's the executive VP of football operations. And I think they sort of recognized that, you know, listen, most of our, our teams are expanding their analytic staffers. We have this this trove of, of player tracking data that can tell us a lot about the game. Uh, we need somebody who can who can come analyze it. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of where the connection was made um, that, that, that they they sort of sort of put together that a, a lot of what traditional analysis had been, um, you know, is a good start. But, you know, the, there's a whole lot of data that we can ask more questions with. And so that's kind of where, you know, I was able to come in and, and help out a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, we have a, a solid team of an analyst that that, again, are answering a lot of questions about game quality. Um, but I think the you know, being able to also merge in, like, when does player tracking data help us? Um, what answers, what questions can we answer using player tracking data uh, in terms of a rules perspective that, you know, quite honestly, we would have had to have watched a lot of film to answer before. Um, I think those are kind of fun things to be able to be a part of. So since you're still in you know, academic land, as well as working with the NFL, you're obviously working with a lot of students. What do you tell students that come to you and say, look, I'm interested in sports analytics career? What are the kind of the boilerplate things that you tell them to get them going down that path? Uh, honestly, the first thing I say is take statistics classes and don't silo yourself into sports. Uh, mm-hmm. And most of that's because there are there are a lot of people that say they're interested in sports analyst careers uh, and that they are interested in sports analyst careers. And the problem is, is that there are a limited number of professional teams, uh, most of which are not hiring at the pace that are necessarily needed to keep up with the people that maybe would want to work with them. And so from, from my perspective, um, you know, this is a, a, a joke that Greg Matthews is one of my good friends has, has told me before is like, did you ever hear of the unemployed statistician? And the answer is, is no, because there isn't one. Um, and if you can be a, a statistics or a data science person uh, that is able to work with data, um, you can help a variety of companies out and you can have a lot more um, uh, peace of mind in terms of like, you can live where you want to live. You can work the hours that you want to work. You can do the type of job that you want to do. Um, if it happens to be sports, great. Um, but to be able to just have a, a, an acumen in data science, I think, is is much more important than maybe just specifically spoke, focusing on one sport. Um, in in terms of uh, like if I if, if people are like dedicated to sports, then then yeah, like yeah, I mean that that's that's a lot of us, and I think there's there's value in in putting work out there and, and trying to do some of that, but. Um, you know, from, from my background, you know, I'm so much better at sports analytics because I took a ton of analytics classes. Uh, and there are a lot of people that have watched more sports than I have. Um, but the, the sort of ability to, to recognize what model or what, what technique might be appropriate for a certain analysis, um, I think can, can be pretty powerful. Aside from the academic statistical, uh, education and learning is, are there any specific say programming languages or other skills that you know are kind of key to where the industry is at right now so given the at least within football given the value of player tracking data to teams in the sense that most teams don't exactly know um all the things we can get out of it and and i don't either i mean none of us do we've had it for for a couple Mm -hmm. years um you, you can't open up a player tracking data in Excel and expect to do anything with it. And so because of that, I think the importance of R or Python as programming languages is, is even higher than maybe it would have been four or five years ago. Uh, and so anybody that wants to work in, in football, just at least on the, on the, on the in-game side, the strategy side, the scouting side, the college player side, um, I, I think R or Python are, are crucial. You can certainly work in business analytics with a, a strong background in Excel or Stata, but for, for my purposes, in terms of what the questions we're, we're doing, um, it can be done a little bit quicker in R or Python, and then it certainly opens up your, your capabilities of doing more advanced analysis. Any other suggestions that you usually give students or, or just any job applicant to kind of stand out in this field? So it, it's tricky because, you know, we're, we're only able to observe the folks who have been hired and right. what they've done to get them hired. And we don't, always know if there were other people that also did those same things, they just didn't get the right break or had the right connection or whatever. Um, it's pretty clear though, that, that some, you know, you're going to get hired for one of two reasons or because you have both of them. One reason is because you, you have really good football ideas. And if you have creative, innovative, 
uh, ways of looking at data that no one's thought of, um, then, then that might be one way in. Um, of course, the second way in is, is to be really good technically. Um, and, you know, whatever, you, you know, building up at both of those skill sets is only going to help you. Um, the folks who are, are obviously most attractive are the ones who do both, who, who know interesting questions to ask about the game, but can also take out R, Python, and code up the answers themselves. Uh, and, and those have generally tended to be the two pathways into the game. Um, for better or for worse, you know, I think that's, that's probably closed some doors that, that should have been left open. Um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, we're, at least in terms of our league and in terms of what we'll try to do is we want to continue to make as many of those doors open as possible. Um, and so that, you know, we, we've seen this common route in teams, but maybe there are other ones that we should be identifying as, as ways that we can also consider um, pushing. With, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. With all the academic work, I'm curious how you watch a football game are you still a fan or just just kind of what's your process if you're just sitting down on a sunday and watching kind of what is your how do you watch a football game uh the quarterback drops back to pass and i hope he doesn't get hurt <laughs> <laughs> safety first uh yeah well it, it's i mean listen we want competitive games and um you know when there are lead changes and and swings that are exciting for fans you know that's that's what you know that's what fans want and that's what we want as a league and so it's it's realistically not much more complicated than that you know i think um there there's nothing we'll, we'll certainly try and pick up on larger patterns in the game or, or, or ways that teams might be acting um you know we're we're messaging each other we constantly come up with with ideas like last year uh you know we were i was sitting with a couple of the the, the folks on my team and watching you know, watching a game and, and there was something that happened and we were like, yeah, we need to look at that. And then sure enough, we, we looked at it and we found that, you know, it was something that maybe we could, you know, push eventually to have a change in the game. And, and so like those things are, are fairly common that we'll, we'll pick up on analyses. This specific one was um, a punt went out of bounds and we were a little unsure where the, uh, the ball should have been marked. Mm -hmm. And of course you can use player tracking data to do that. And so, you know, those are the, the types of questions we can use with player tracking data, but you also have to sort of recognize like, you know, how often do punts out of bounds happen? Which team are they generally favoring? Um, you sort of have to recognize that maybe our, our ball data, because we have a, a chip in the ball, you know, is that accurate all the time on punt plays? Or is that sometimes also, you know, on the wrong side of the field for various reasons? So, um, yeah, and we're, we're, we're trying to think of ways to make the game better mostly, but, you know, also we want the quarterbacks healthy. <laughs> sure. Finishing up with Michael Lopez of the NFL here on expected value. A uh, handful of just kind of random quick hitting questions to finish things off here. What is your favorite number and why? I was 59 in college. So the number 59. And did, very, did you pick 59 for any particular reason? Uh, because I was a freshman, it was the last lineman <laughs> number left. Yep. Yep. I would say though that when I used to play poker, I would always play a five nine off suit because like I wasn't a very good poker player and I would try and think of the odds. And so I knew I needed one hand to occasionally bluff on. And so right. if I ever got a five nine off suit, that was my time to, to bluff. <laughs> I, like, I like it. I like it. What's uh, what's your favorite statistic for any reason? It doesn't have to be a you know quality or sort of reason, just favorite stat that uh, you like to look at. Um so this is an interesting one. Um I would coach with my dad. And we, we played in a Super Bowl at Gillette Stadium. And we had a fourth and one at our own 30-yard line in the second quarter. And I convinced him to go for it. And we got it. Um, and so afterwards, I looked up how often any NFL coach had gone for it on fourth and one at Gillette Stadium inside mm -hmm. their own 30 yard line on, in, you know, in the first half and, and not a single one had done it. All right. Um, so that's kind of my, it's an anecdote. It's not really a stat, sure. but it's something that um, I, I, I take a little bit of pride in only in the sense that, you know, I, I convinced a, a coach who had been doing it 35 years to, to do something different. Yeah, for sure. Who's your favorite athlete that you've had with growing up? Just your kind of your all time favorite athlete, any sport. Tommy Frazier, the option quarterback at Nebraska. Ah, I like that. So how did, uh, as growing up in Boston, how did you get connected with him? So, uh, one of my dad's, uh, uh, he played wide receiver at my dad's school, but he, okay. he went to Nebraska and he played outside linebacker. He was eventually rookie of the year in the NFL. Um, and so he was, he was at Nebraska. Uh, Mike Crow was his name. He ended up being rookie of the year in the NFL mm -hmm. for his rookie year. Um, 
because obviously that's that's when you're rookie of the year. Right. Uh, and, uh, anyway, so I got into Nebraska because of him. And then the, the next quarterback after he was there was sort of the mid-90s was Tommy Frazier. And so I love the option, and it was really cool to watch at the time. And, and now I realize I would I would never install that in an offense right now. But uh, at the time, it was really neat. Uh, something we all go through is that moment we realize we're not playing sports professionally. It's earlier for some of us and later for others. Did you have a moment when you kind of realized, like, okay, this is about where my sports career is going to end up? Um, <laughs> I was always last in sprints and, you know, it didn't take, it didn't take long. One of my best friends growing up was, was, uh, uh, and, and his name is, his name is Nate. And so in middle school, we ran the 40 yard dash. Incidentally, the principal who, who was running it event was also my dad. Cause he was a principal and football coach. And so we line up everybody up for the 40 yard dash to time us ourselves. So we all do through it once and then we get to do it a second time. Anyways, Nate ran it backwards and beat me. Um, <laughs> so that was a, a pretty good, like, all right, you know, maybe I can play in high school and I, I played in college, but for, for that was a, that was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm sufficiently humbled at this point. <laughs> and we'll close with, uh, what's a, how did I get here type of moment that you've had, uh, maybe since joining the NFL, just one of those where you kind of take a sec, look around and you're like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool where I've gotten to career wise. So I think last year to meet Coach Tomlin and Coach Payton, and uh, you know I shared um, the example I used at competition committee last year was a game between uh, uh, Ozzie Newsom and John Meyer were also in the room. So I, I did a game between the Giants and the Ravens from 2017 in terms of introdu- introducing win probability to that group. Um, and, and Coach Tomlin and Coach Payton at the sort of the break, um, they wanted their game from the Saints Steelers last year, and they wanted the um, or they wanted me to rank the swing and win probabilities based on the penalties in that game. Okay. Um, and that, that was, first of all, it was really cool from a, um, like they're actually talking to me type of perspective. Yeah. Um, but it was also interesting in that, like, you know, I had written a function that you just plug in the game ID and then you get the win probability chart. And so they had kind of asked it like, all right, you know, maybe in like two or three days, you can get that to us. But like they asked it and then you know, two seconds later, I'm like, oh yeah, here it is. <laughs> it's right here. Um, and like, that's, that's, that's not, that's just sort of the, the power of, of computing at this point is that, you know, if, if you're, if you're ready to rock, like you don't have to wait a long time for some of these analyses and to be able to share with them, you know, there was a, um, you know, they, they were, there was a call early in that game that was a, a fourth and one, a penalty on Joe Hayden, uh, defensive pass interference. And it was a certainly a questionable call and a close one. And so they remembered that one. Um, but there was also, there was a holding penalty on a, a drive late in that game, I think on the Saints. Um, and anyways, Coach Payton immediately like, yep, that was the one. And he could like point to the pot, the, the spot on the chart where it occurred. Um, mm-hmm. And to be able to have that type of engagement um, was, was, was definitely like, you know, I, I could have, you know, between the the Patriots winning the Super Bowl and and Coach Payton looking at my graph and pointing at it, I'm like, all right, they could fire me now, and I'll be, yeah. I'll be, I'll be, I'll leave happy. <laughs> That's great, good story to end with. Michael Lopez, NFL Director of Football Data and Analytics, thank you for joining us here on the Expected Value Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. It was a lot of fun. Back in the True Media Network studios, I'm Paul Carr, joined by Albert Larcata, True Media's Senior Director of Business Development and Data Science. Albert, from a data analytics perspective, I think Mike's doing a lot of good things for the league, for the analytics community on the whole. What stood out to you from that interview? Yeah, so the first thing that stood out was Adam Schefter needs to get a little bit nervous. Paul Carr might be coming for his job. Some breaking big data bowl news you got out of Mike there. <laughs> yeah, number number two is coming back soon. I think I'm going to need like three more cell phones and much less sleep if I want to be Adam Schefter. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if your wife's going to like that. No, so. no. Maybe his maybe Schefter's safe, but some good good uh, insight and good sort of teasers from Mike on. Uh, Big data bowl two and what what might be coming type of project. I think you mentioned rushing type yep. project might be in the cards. So anyway, that's kind of cool. We'll we'll sort of yeah. see what comes out publicly from that. But good to hear that that might be coming back. Um, but no, so yeah, my my kind of higher level takeaway, not anything specific he said, but just more broadly hearing him and listening to his stories is. From a jobs perspective, there's so many types of jobs, even in a very niche field like sports analytics. I think what most people, you know, 
people in college, job seekers in general think of when you hear a sports analytics job is, you know, you work for a team. You're in Moneyball. You had Billy Bean and, um, you know, all those guys working for a team and using numbers and all that. And that's probably what most people's, you know, quote unquote, dream job might be. But there are so many other people and so many other types of businesses that are uh, not even tangentially. They're directly involved in the sports analytics field. Uh, people like Mike, who are working for l- league offices in the NFL, NBA, etc. Uh, people working for data providers, uh, Pro Football Focus, SIS, and football. There's a lot in soccer as well. Uh, software companies like us. I mean, you and I are working in the sports analytics field, working pretty directly with teams in sports media. And, you know, we don't work for a team. Uh, sports media is another one. ESPN has a huge group of people doing stuff. So just at a high level, it's kind of interesting how the sports analytics industry is so broad in terms of the number of jobs and types of jobs you can have. Um, and to be honest, it, a lot of the jobs that are not with teams by, you know, more traditional metrics like, you know, job security, quality of life, work life balance, um, and sometimes in some cases, just salary, the types of jobs outside of teams end up being a little bit better than jobs with teams. So something to think about if you're looking to get into the sports analytics world, think more broadly than just working for a team. There's lots of other opportunities out there. Yeah, I think that's it's kind of a challenge. I mean, on both ends, both from a seeker and an employer perspective, um, just to expose these different jobs and different companies. He's got to learn about them, and if you're not in the industry, sometimes it's tough to learn about. And and I mean, you're right. Like when we were in college, you know, 15 years ago or so, like the jobs we have now didn't exist, and so many of these companies didn't exist, at least on the scale that they do now. And the sports field and analytics field. They just both keep growing so fast. There's so many more opportunities that people can have now that it's good to make sure that everyone's just aware. Of. They they know they want to work for a team and it's a glamorous spot. But there's lots of other things out there that you have the opportunities and you're not going to have to beat out 150 people just to get this one internship with the Indians or whatever it is. Like You've got lots of different opportunities outside the teams themselves. One thing that kind of stood out to me came from, it was a couple different answers kind of combined. He was talking about how coaches want quick answers and sometimes video is better for that. Uh, and for a numbers guy like Mike to say that, you know, that that means something. And, and he's right. It might be sometimes quicker for a coach to sit down and watch all of the punts, like Mike said, that a gunner covered than for an analyst to build out a model that might take a couple of days. The coach can watch the video in an hour or two. And then again, sometimes the numbers are fast and easy. He had that story with it was Mike Tomlin or Sean Payton asking about how much a penalty affected a game. And Mike had the win probability in a few seconds when they were expecting it might take, you know, hours or a day or two. And ultimately, I think all that just goes to this whole coaches and analytics thing, not the coaches or analytics thing that sometimes you get those two painted as if they're always going against each other. But I think they will work together more. And that he just had two examples that were good where you look at the two, what gives me the best answer and or the fastest answer and you go from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. And r- related to that, he, during the interview brought up how, you know, h- historically a lot of the analysis that is sort of the gold standard now is based off of play by play data, event data. That's, you know, something like 160 rows worth of data per game. And that's just not enough to Mm -hmm. have a chat with an NFL coach who is watching a single play on video and in his mind gathering thousands of observations from that one video clip. And in your data set, you basically have one row with, you know, some number of columns in it. Um, So tracking data is going to help a lot with that. You're going to be able to observe more things, gain more insights than you ever could off of event level data. So those types of conversations with coaches will uh, be a lot more fruitful uh, for the data side, the analyst side. They'll be able to, you know, have a little more uh, fighting chance, if mm-hmm. you will, with all of the data they'll have access to. Yeah, because I think, I mean, as as you know from dealing with teams and such, a lot of times the end goal for an analyst is to get to video. So, hey, I can find and show that this is happening, but if I can't sh- then connect that to video, like the coach or the player just isn't going to be interested. So the, yeah, the tracking data is going to help with that a lot uh, on both ends, really. And that music means it's about time to wrap things up for this episode of Expected Value. Thanks again to the NFL's Mike Lopez for being our guest. Next week, we'll talk with Jared Hughes, currently a pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies, to get a player's perspective on consuming and using analytics, baseball's launch angle revolution, and much more. 
Next week, Albert and I will also be at the Nessus Conference in Boston, so please say hi to us there. Guest suggestions and feedback are always welcome via email at expectedvalue at truemedianetworks.com. That's True Media Networks, T-R-U Media Networks, or on Twitter publicly or via DM at True Media Sports or at Paul Carr. And please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends, coworkers, family, pets to do the same. On behalf of Albert Larcata and everyone here at True Media Networks, I'm Paul Carr. Thanks again for listening to Expected Value.